We're here in downtown Central City. Oh, this piece. Oh. This water is freezing cold. Here's another piece of gold. Look at the quartz on it. Welcome to South Park, Colorado. Do some stupid things every once in a while. Ooh. Gotta be careful. Hi, I'm Tom Massey, and welcome to Gold Fever. Welcome to Gold Fever and welcome to South Park, Colorado. <laughs> Woo! Well, that was something. What do you say we take a look around? Gold was first discovered here in South Park in 1859. After that, the gold rush was on. Gold and silver mining were a major economic factor in towns such as this. Around the same time gold was discovered here in South Park, the mining district known as Fair Play Diggins was established. The town, as a result, is known today as Fair Play, Colorado. The term Fair Play was derived from, well, you guessed it, just like it sounds, Fair Play. It was under the opinion that everyone would have Fair Play. As you can see, it didn't turn out that way. Pretty much to the contrary. People began striking it rich, getting gold, and the town of Fair Play became lawless as the rest of them. Hey, that's my drink. Prosperity and mining led men, women, and families to migrate to these rich parts of Colorado and eventually, Fair Play and other South Park communities became more settled. The townspeople stayed entertained by dance hall girls, saloons, and gambling houses, while gold and silver were being shipped hand over foot to Denver and Canyon City. In today's show, we're going all over Colorado in search of that yellow metal gold. We'll also be talking about the rich, colorful history of this state. When we come back, we'll take you over to Central City and take a look at the richest square mile on Earth. Stick around, partner. You could strike it rich. We're here in Central City. And this place is said to be the richest square mile on the planet. Why is it so rich? Well, it's because of all the mines that are around here. It's like Swiss cheese out here with all the different tailing piles. And they ran all this material through here, dropped it down into a tunnel, a four mile long tunnel that goes out to Idaho Springs. And this is right here is a Doc Holliday Casino. A lot of history here. Doc Holliday was here doing his gambling and his gunslinging before he went down to Tombstone down there with uh, White Earp and that story. And then he came back here, eventually succumbed to his tuberculosis out there at Glenwood Hot Springs. But this is a real colorful town here back in 1980. Uh, they made the gambling, low stakes gambling for a few of these old mining towns here in Colorado legal. And it's kind of rejuvenated them. But, uh, there's just a lot of history and colorful scenery and a really neat place to come and visit. But we're going to go out into the hills and poke around and see what we can find. Colorado's gold production ranks right up there with the big boys. With more than 40 million ounces. For many years, mining was the main economic factor in the state. But those old timers didn't get it all, and there's still gold in them there hills. You just gotta know where to look. That's real dangerous back there. 
this is an area where they've got just oh gotta be careful and they got just lots and lots of these mines like this poking around in here and and all these mines went down to one central point, a um, four and a half mile long tunnel, the Argo Tunnel. And they brought all the ore in there and they were able to ship it out of there and ran it down here at the Argo Mill. So anybody that could hook up with the tunnel, they had an easy way to drain the water out of their mine. You can see the water coming out of this mine, so it probably don't connect up with the Argo Tunnel. But they were able to process their ore and it made it easier for them for mining up in here. But you know, if you're thinking about going back in one of these places not a good idea I know we do it here on the show but I've been doing it all my life and mined underground and this one here is real dangerous and most of the other ones are here around are real dangerous and I don't recommend going back in there but if you want to go back in a mine and you don't want to take the kids and stuff and have a little bit of an adventure going back in there there's some tourist mines around here that are pretty neat and they they're uh, pretty fun to go and check out and we're gonna go down here and see if we can't find the front entrance of the Argo Tunnel. See if we can get back in there. We're here with Bob. Right off of I-70 in the heart of Colorado is a very interesting mining place. Can you tell us some about this place? Yes, this is the Argo Gold Mill. The Argo Gold Mill is centered around the Argo Tunnel. The Argo Tunnel was the longest mining service tunnel in the world for many years. It was dug from here 4.2 miles all the way over to Central City. This tunnel connected to five to 600 gold mines. All those gold mines would bring their ore into this mill to be processed before it was shipped down to Denver to the smelters to be smelted into gold bars. So you guys run tours through here? Somebody can come here and uh, take a tour back in the mine and through the mill? Yes, we do, Tom. Well, I'd like to see it. Well, I'd love to show it to you. Okay, let's take a look. All right. We're, we would be right there. in this location over here. Right. So they dug the tunnel back here, let me, let me and then it intersects wheel. these different mines. So these, these are mines that come down and drop into the tunnel at Argo all these Gold different Mills locations. Tunnel. So, so like I own this mine and I'm mining here and I come down and I connect into the tunnel so it makes it easier for me getting my material out for, to the mill. Absolutely. And this guy owns this mine and this guy owns this mine and they're all kind of coming through. And then, so whose idea was it to connect everybody up together to bring their, all their, their that, that gold been, out to one location? That would have been Samuel New, Newhouse and Lewis Hanchett. The mill was designed uh, to uh, process all types of ore, not, not only those high-grade ores, but, but low-grade ores as well, keeping the, the mines in business uh, operating 20 to 30 years longer than they would have had it not been for the economic and efficient uh, means uh, of the Argo Tunnel and Mill working together. Get that hole drilled, but when they kick the throttle back like this, it's gonna blow out their dust or slurry, making it ready to load with their blasting powder. Typically, your miners would drill all the holes in the end of the mine, or the face of the mine, leaving the center hole open. This one was known as the blow hole. The rest they would fill with blasting powder, cutting the fuses in the center holes a little bit shorter than those on the outside. When they would light that main fuse, those in the center blew first, leaving a void for the outer ones to blow into. And in blasting, it's known as a rotation. He's getting on the bus. Oh, <laughs> the bus. <laughs> I'm gonna go back here and see if I can find the prettiest girl in school to sit by. The camaraderie, the adventure, and doling into the incredible history of prospecting. That just can't be beat. Well, here we are. One thing's for sure, those old timers weren't afraid of a little hard work. All right, Tom, here we are at the Double Eagle Gold Mine. 
When these two guys started digging this mine, the first place they found gold was along this flat wall here, known as a foot wall. Uh, they kept digging the mine, and, and then the foot wall would come over to this side over here. They're finding gold all along this flat wall here. The, the vein was probably between uh, one half to six inches wide. Uh, they're still getting gold all along this flat wall here, foot wall. So the rest of this mine was dug hope mining, hoping to find something. These holes were drilled over 120 years ago by the guys who dug this mine. Uh, as I said, they would have made them deeper before they loaded them with blasting powder. Notice they left a little gold up there, Tom. Do you see that? Well, why would they leave gold in this mine? I think it's because they, this mine was dug just with candles for light. Uh, a little quartz vein. These guys might have been following that quartz vein, hoping to get into some more gold. Uh, then we have a little pyrites on the side there. Uh, is, this, is this bent over? Cause people, yeah. That's exactly why it's bent over. And they try and get in there. And, and, uh, and then, uh, if it's go gold! It's yeah. gold right there! Mm -hmm. Gotta get that gold out! Yeah. It's really just a, a good example of where Mother Nature deposited gold, man came in and extracted. Mm -hmm. That's a good visual right there, seeing what they were after and how it laid in there and what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this seems kind of like it was a poor boy mine. Yep, it did, absolutely. A couple of guys that were uh, yeah. you know, making a go of it and found some pretty good gold mm -hmm. from time to time and whooped it up in the saloon and then spent it all and had to come back in here and do some more digging and then eventually, like you said, it might have played out on them here and mm -hmm. it could be where just, you know, three feet over this way yep. is a whole bunch more of that. The big mother load is just right over here, but you know, don't know. Don't know. Yeah. The Argo Tunnel was the longest mining service tunnel in the world for many years. It would go straight for 19,000 feet and then it took two slight turns to the east so they could hook up with the famous Glory Hole Mine. Over 500 miners a day were transported through this tunnel. They would then get hoisted up to the level of the mine that they were working. Now after they got their gold bearing ore out of their mine, instead of hoisting it up to the surface, they dropped it down into the tunnel, loaded it into ore carts like we saw out on the fence out there, brought those ore carts out so that it could be processed by this mill. You notice that it is still draining water today. This tunnel drains about 250,000 gallons of water each day today. Today the water uh, goes into those grates right there and into the building behind us. This building behind us, this water treatment plant, pulls out 36 tons of material out of that water each day. The water is very acidic. It has an acidic level of 2.25 to 3.0. That's sulfuric acid. I just look at it and I think about, you know, all that stuff that's back in there and the engineering marvel oh, that yeah. went into it oh, yeah. and that, you know, we could see pictures of it, but it's, it's all right back in there. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about, you know, building the Statue of Liberty or, or building the Lincoln Tunnel or the, this was an engineering marvel and a tremendous amount of work that went in to, to creating this and the, and the, the money that came out of it. Oh you yeah. Know? Oh yeah. And it was financed by British investors. You see, uh, now, and what, what kind of tools? But they made it pay. Yeah. They made this one, this one worked. Yeah, and, and what kind of tools did they have back then? Level, miner's transit. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. The compass. <laughs> all those old assay offices, they always spill the gold around in there over time. Even I do, man. When I get my gold, I'm always spilling it, and there's a little bit. I'm like, ah, it's just a little bit. Ah, it's a little bit. But when a place like this, where they do it all the time, it builds up over time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you notice something about these, as opposed to those other ones or one ton ore carts? These don't dump. They're, 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 there's no, uh, there's nothing that, that you can't just dump them. So you had to use a rotary tip. Uh-huh. Okay. 
So you could take three of these ore carts full of ore, and they carry three tons of ore, and, and, and sometimes the trains coming out of the Argo Tunnel were as long as 100 cars long. They stopped at the assayer's office. The assayer would assay the ore, determine how much gold, silver, copper, lead, and zinc was in it. Then, then the, those trains would come uh, over to this machine over here, a rotary tipple. They could load three of those ore carts into this rotary tipple, lock it in those ore carts into place with this lever right here. The driver was over there. He pulled one of those levers, and it caused the rotary tipple to travel along its railroad tracks. When it got to the right ore bin, he pushed that lever up and pulled the other lever down, causing the rotary tipple to roll over, dumping the ore out into the ore bins. Underneath these ore bins is a conveyor belt. The rocks traveled along the conveyor belt uh, over into a lift bucket system like we have over there, got lifted up into that house up there. Well, in that house was a chute where they could direct the ore so that it would get the proper type of processing. I, I'm looking at this and thinking that this really had a lot of sophistication Oh, to yeah. it more so than what you look at on the outside because when those ore carts pulled up from all those different mines you had a variety of different ores and so they had to process those different ores in right. different ways and when a cart would pull up and they had visible gold in there and the, and the assayer would look at it and say this is the type of ore where we're going to have visible gold they'd run it through the crushers and, and run it through a different process yeah. and then they'd pull some of it that had sulfide ore where the, the, the gold is, is not visible but they know there's still rich gold inside of it. Let's go down, let's go down and see some more things here. We've got a, a lot to see. It is said that when this mill was operating it was heard 13 miles away in Georgetown. Or another way to put it, it could drown out Niagara Falls. This whole mill was run by just three to five men. It's just a collection uh, of old uh, uh, mining equipment throughout the centuries. Uh, Cleveland's and, and Gardner Denver's and, and different things. Where did you guys get the, the equipment? Well, um, we've had people donate it. Uh, we bought equipment. Uh, we've been collecting equipment since uh, 1976 uh, when we opened it up uh, as a as a tourist. This baby story. came out of the mine. You bet it did. <laughs> yep. Days of old and the days of gold. Those old timers left behind some pretty incredible stories, but we stand on their shoulders and reap the benefits of the hard labor that they put in and the economic impact of that gold coming up out of the ground, it makes us all as Americans just a little bit richer. Well, Bob, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here and preserving the history and letting people come here and see it and educating them and touring them through here. It's really a great place. And if you get out here on Highway 70 and you're coming along, this is a place you don't want to miss out on. Pull in here and take a look through the Argo Mill. Well, Tom, I sure appreciate you coming out and letting people know about this place. We look forward to seeing it. All right, thanks for the tour. You bet. Well, we're, we're here with the owner of the Phoenix Mine. And how long have you been giving the tours here at the mine? Well, I'll tell you, about it. I take a lot of tourists through this mine, see? I've been doing it for quite a few years, Tom. Not what's your name, right, Tom? Yeah. Okay. And uh, my father was a miner here. My grandfather was a miner. I kind of grew up in this industry. And uh, I was trying to get mining going for quite a while. I worked on quite a few different things and operations. And then in, when one time I got fed up with the government, fed up with them. They were so many little regulatory agencies kept bugging us that I couldn't. It's tough to try to earn a living. Well, you know, the thing that uh -huh. a lot of people don't really recognize is, you know, these mines in this area and the miners over the years coming in here, is, you know, the hard work that they put in, they got, you know, paid a wage for the work, but the work that they did and the gold and the minerals and the things that came out of these mines, they went to mints and, you know, the money that was brought out was real wealth. 
It was wealth out of the ground. And over those years, that's, you know, money that went to those stockbrokers in New York City, money that went to help pay for building skyscrapers and all mm -hmm. kinds of other industry. This was wealth that came from the ground, not wealth that just changes hands. Somebody winning the lottery or someone going down and pulling a slot machine and winning a million dollars. That's just money coming from one hand to another hand, exchanging money. This is wealth that we brought up out of the ground. Sure. And it it's a tie that raises all boats. So everybody in the country benefits from these minerals and from these miners that brought that gold up out of the ground. Historically, you know, all the, the, the wars and the, and the money that we've spent and the things and the freedoms that we enjoy came a lot from these, these miners and these, yes, these guys that we stand on their shoulders today. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't known you very long, but I already admire your thoughts. Yeah. I know they're right. Well, let's take oh, okay. a walk back here in your mind. Yeah. You know how to do that? <laughs> you probably do, I'm sure. I'll hold your light for you then. So you hit once a turn. We'll hit and turn. Very good. He you know what he's doing. That chips into dust. And if that was, uh, the steel's kind of dull, but that's how the old miners used to drill a hole to put dynamite in. Put the dust. The slow way. Yeah. The slow way. You got it. Single jacking. And then the double jacking where somebody's out here with a sledge and hitting a bigger steel. Yeah. And, and then the guy with guts holding the steel. Well, the way that works is you hold it and you turn it. Mm -hmm. And then if the guy swinging the sledge hits you, then you start swinging the sledge. <laughs> he better hit you on the head. So you just you rotate. Out. So you so That's he right. knows if he whacks you, it's going to be your turn That's next. Right. <laughs> When it comes to hard rock mining, old Mother Earth plays her cards pretty close to her chest. It takes a crafty miner to sniff out that yellow gold deep inside the earth. This is a tilt pillar, very rich oil lift here to keep the walls safe, you know, for safety, after you support. See it here? Mm-hmm. Thought this was a fool's gold. Looks just like fool's gold. Now, now, most people don't understand. understand. So we call it the rich cousin of fool's gold. It, it's very rich in gold. She'll give up her riches to those who aren't afraid of hard work. But she'll take your life if you're greedy or careless. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Sachs. I'm a uh, uh, retired land surveyor from Florida. I've been working here for three years now. And instead of prospecting out in the streams, now I hang out inside the mine, drilling holes and blasting out giant chunks of gold ore now. Now we're about to go 100 feet down here in the wind section down here. Now down there, the vein is 11 feet thick. The mine punches right through the middle of it so everything down there sparkles. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, everything. It's all one big chunk of vein we're walking through. Are you sure that's pyrite? Remember what I told you, I want you to make sure your fans know the difference. This stuff looks just like fool's gold. And I was the fool for 15 years. This doesn't look like fool's gold, this looks like gold gold. Let's try it the other way, unless you guys feel brave. I'm always brave. Many a miner have lost their lives to the dreaded cave-in. All it takes is one wrong move. This is the formations you get from the water action coming in through here, typical of, of caves. And this is starting to form cave formations from the minerals, minerals in the water. You're asking about your stalactites and malactites. Just starting, maybe in another hole. 2,000 years, it'll be a lot more prominent. Caved in here. Yeah, we'll stay away from that section. I'm sorry, I promise you to go the other way. You see <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, we'll it's getting, getting pretty hairy, huh? Yeah. 
Well, it definitely looks like copper. Next record so you can see through it, right? Yeah, this would be what you're talking about. This stuff, sweepings. Yeah, sweepings. So much free gold in there, you sweep it out, take it around to a forest, and you have to camp it. Like this stuff. Hey. You can see the the uh, the stuff that's more yellow. These were seams in here that were created, and this came into those seams as this was already hard solid rock and this was already hard solid rock and this was molten and these quartz came in here at a later date because they found in these seams and then that steam came with it that was that had the the gold and the mineralizations that were condensed inside there and then when it it solidified and got hard it formed all this mineralization in here all these variety of minerals and just I'm just gonna see, I can just pull this piece, whoop, piece off. You can just see that, just incredible mineralization. The world up there, that is just incredible. Just to have a whole mine of this stuff. Oh no, this is the mine that's been dug out. What you're looking at was left by the old guys to hold the ceiling up. They had to leave these in here for support so this doesn't completely cave in. I mean, it's suicidal to mine these out of here. And there are some places where they have attempted to do what they call retreat mining, where they've come in and they know that these pillars in here are very rich. And so they try to support as they retreat and take these pillars out. And it's ended up into some pretty disastrous mistakes. The, uh, the mine that, that collapsed in not too long ago in Utah, a lot of people are suspecting that was retreat mining. Uh, and a lot of other places where they've attempted at retreat mining, it's been disastrous. And this is very, very tempting to, ta to haul out. But when you remove that support, it's, it's like a deck of cards. You could pull one card out, maybe you're okay. You pull another card out, maybe you're okay. You pull another card out, maybe you're okay. But sooner or later, you're gonna pull that one card out, and then when this one goes, it causes that one to go, and that one to go, and that one to go, and then somebody's saying, it felt like an earthquake underneath there. The whole mountain shook, because it all lets go. And if you're in here pulling this stuff out, that's the last time they're gonna see it and you'll never see the light of day again. The rescue coming in here, not gonna get to us. Nope. They're just gonna stick a headstone up there and say, there they are down in that mine. And there's many a mines where there's cave-ins and there's bones still in there. They, you know, they, those old timers that were in here, they were smart cookies, you know, they built up this to stope that out and then let gravity feed that material coming down here and then a lot of it collects up here against this and then they'd open up these chutes and then load their ore carts to haul it out and let gravity fall that material down in here and since they haven't been hauling the material out and that material has been sloughing down in there and building up and building up and now it's got too much material in there and it's stressing on this and sooner or later, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 100 years, that pressure, the pressure is gonna break all of that. It might, it, it's gonna happen eventually in here. You know, when this wood starts decaying, it'll, it'll hold up a long time because it's way underground here, but sooner or later that pressure and gravity is gonna win out. Miners truly go where no man has gone before, deep into the bowels of the earth, chasing Mother Nature's treasure. And what a reward when you find it. I feel some fresh air coming out of here. At the end of the day, the gold isn't the real treasure. It's the memories that you make finding it. Getting kind of tight. Well, let me turn my light off. Thank you so much. That was just fabulous well, down underneath Tom. there. You see my favorite really place in the world it. for the gold. Yeah, yeah. That was really cool. Really something. Yeah, those old guys in the old days, I could imagine them being down there before all the really good stuff was picked out. 
Can you imagine that stuff being everywhere, four to eight feet thick? Some places 11 feet thick. That's something. Well, this is what happens when you try and drive over the Continental Divide doing some four buying with a Toyota minivan that's made for hauling kids to soccer practice. I wasn't driving, Cindy was though. <laughs> but we put a hole right through the side of this tire. We're gonna jack this thing up and switch it out. Delay us a little bit of filming here today. But uh, we'll get rolling again and get this thing fixed. And Hopefully we can get out of here without getting some too seriously stuck. I drove right where he told me to go. So change that tire, Massey. Cindy. Yeah, I think you might have knocked that gas tank bracket off and I think the muffler here is taking a pretty good size hit. I don't know if that gas tank is going to hold on there. Just have to take it slow. We'll just keep checking it. Got banged up pretty good on the undercarriage here. I think one of those springs might be bent too. Whew. Uh oh. Is this another car part right here? Really shouldn't be four buying with a minivan. Not a whole lot of clearance there either, Clarence. Oh, looky here, I don't think this is our car part, is it? <laughs> Do some stupid things every once in a while. I'm just gonna chalk that one up to gold fever. But we eventually made it to where we were trying to get to high rocky mountain stream that was just loaded with gold. Come on gold, go through my hose. I'm gonna go shut the dredge off here and yak to you a little while and tell you where I'm at. Now, one of the things that I've learned about here in Colorado is the bigger gold is up at the higher elevations. And when I was younger, actually it wasn't too long ago, I always thought, well, gee, 11, 12,000 feet, how the heck can you have any gold up that high? Well, after prospecting out here in Colorado, you get up that high, and that's where the new gold's coming in. That's where the erosion is because this is lifted up so high that everything starts out at nine, 10,000 feet. And you can tell I'm a little winded because we're just shy of 12,000 feet right here and there's not a whole lot of oxygen. So one of the things that you also gotta do when you're up this high is you gotta pace yourself because uh, you get that oxygen depletion and your head gets a little bit dizzy. But let me tell you about what I'm doing here. I got me a little mini dredge. These are easy to backpack in places. I come up through here and walked up the creek and found me a spot that I liked up in here. And it's still a lot of snow. I had to trudge through some snow to get up in here. A little bit early in the season, but I, maybe just right. And this water is freezing cold. This is a two and a half inch, and it's got this hose up here. It's just like a big dredge, but just miniature size. And it comes down in here, and that engine right here, this little engine, and this little pump here, this pump creates an eddy, or spins in here and creates high pressure water, goes through this little jet right here, shoots into my box, creates a suction out there on the end. I got these collapsible pontoons here, make it easier for packing it around. The whole thing collapses down, fits on a backpack. And back here, I got my riffle tray, and this is where my gold's gonna be trapping if I'm getting any gold up in here. And I'm doing what they call long arm dredging. 
I'm not in the water with my wetsuit, but I'm just reaching out there with my arms and my boots in this cold water and seeing if I can suck up some of the yellow stuff. So I'm gonna get back to work, pace myself, because boy, I tell you, that's something up here this high up. I, I don't think I've ever dredged this high up, uh, mining for gold. But this is where it's at in Colorado. It's way up here, way up in the Rocky Mountain High. So I'm gonna get fired back up here, suck some more material and see if we can't get some gold in the sluice box. that you got and with this small dredge I like to cut my finger over the end so I don't get plugged that's where you suck up a big enough rock it goes up through there and gets plugged you know and it doesn't take too big a rock sometimes you get some of those rocks that are just wedged in there on that bedrock down there and you you can use a little pry bar or something to kind of pry them loose. And I'm just working down to where I got that, there's like a hard packed granite kind of bedrock that runs in and around here. And if you can get into the cracks and crevices, but I can only go down so far. I don't want to get water over my gloves because this water is freezing cold. I ain't going to kid you. Mining for gold, hard work. That gold just ain't going to jump in your pocket. That's for sure. When you're running by yourself, you gotta check the sluice box every now and then and tend your own dredge. Digging for gold can be back-breaking work sometimes. If it was easy, it wouldn't be worth over a thousand dollars an ounce for that yellow gold. Well, I think we're cut off here. I'll go down and take a look inside the sluice box. Clean up here a little bit, last of it. Now what I like to do is set my hose there where it's nice sucking water. I'll set my tool right here. We'll go down and take a look inside the sluice box. I like to let it suck a little bit of water so it clears the sluice box out so you can get a better look in there. That way you don't have as much material down inside the sluice. Now what I'm gonna do is a cleanup. Now this is a baffle, knocks the water down so it uh, doesn't shoot all in here at once, so it's easier for your gold to get stuck in there. And then this is a classifying screen right here. See this right here? Your uh, bigger rocks can't penetrate through this, and they come down here the lower part of the sluice box where you got these larger size Hungarian riffles right here, and the gold's heavy and it rides along, gets stuck right in behind the riffle inside the dredge and stays inside my box. By screening off those larger rocks, it makes it easier for those finer, those smaller pieces of gold to get stuck down in here in the box. Ooh, I see a piece of gold! Look at that, it's a nugget. It's a nugget. Look at that. Oh, a beautiful piece. Look how, look how uh, crystalline it is. Look at the little piece of quartz in there. See how coarse that piece is? That's telling me that the gold that I'm finding here in this creek has not traveled very far. It's come just from the mountainside, maybe even just a little ways up here, and it hasn't had a whole lot of time to roll around and get mashed in here. So that one right there is really, really fresh. Oh, here's another one. Here's another piece of gold. Look at the quartz on it. See that quartz that's still in there? That's the stuff that it's traveling inside. And so this quartz rock that's in there makes it light enough where it stays up closer to the surface and travels along, not getting down in there below. Those are hard to say because that quartz is light enough it wants to roll along and work its way on outside the box. But man, is that nice. Two little pieces, ah, there's another piece. And another one. Oh, I got gold in here. Look at that, nice yellow gold. Look at those pieces. Look how coarse, wow, look at that. Just coarse gold. Well, we'll dump the rest of this stuff off out of here. I'll put this stuff inside my snuffer bottle. Kerplunk, 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 kerplunk. 
Nice, nice little chunky stuff. You just want to make sure and slurry that material real good. Make sure you got all that material in there liquefied and that lets the gold, which is heavy, work its way down to the bottom. But I tell you one thing, I'm out here really inspecting these pieces of quartz out here because a lot of them got gold traveling along with them because we're so close to the mother load. That's what they talk about, the mother load. That's the gold that's still up there in the hillside and you could find gold down here in the creek and then work your way up the creek to where it is in the load material and then you can get back into the load material and find a whole bunch of gold back up in there where this source is. Now I'm just kind of slowly working that down. Easy does it. Boy, look at the black sand in there. Nice little slurry action using these riffles to trap any gold I got in there. Now I'm getting it down. I'm going to take a little bit more, a little bit more. Oh, I see a growler in there. I see some yellow gold. Oh, another big old chunk. Look at that yellow gold. Look at the gold. Look at the quartzy piece. I saved that in my pan. Those are hard to say because, like I said before, look at all the quartz on that and that little bit of gold on there. That little bit of gold is just heavy enough to make it stay inside my gold pan. Just enough. That's incredible. Pull a piece out like that. These are real specimen pieces. Hard to save. Here's another bigger piece. Chunky piece. I'll put that with my other stuff. I got my snuffer bottle here. And look at a lot of a lot of the smaller fine stuff mixed in there around the black sand. That's pretty good. We really appreciate you tuning in here to the show. Hope you had a good time. I just love it out here in the Colorado Rockies. This is just a beautiful place to go prospecting. You know, they got the basketball team, the pro team, the Denver Nuggets. And they're named after the gold and they got the pick and shovel sign. They got the big mural there in the airport when you come in. A lot of gold mining history there. A lot of places out here to explore. I'm just Tipping is just the tip of the iceberg out here are the good places to go out prospecting and yeah, it's really enjoyable. I hope you think about getting involved in prospecting because it brings you out to a lot of beautiful places and uh, it's just really enjoyable. So we'll see you again here on another one of these Gold Fever shows. Never know where we'll wind up. Colorado's Mechanical Miners. Well here in Swan Creek, there's an old derelict. It's seen better days. Many bottles of champagne were broken on this portal. You rolling? Yeah. Adam? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, give me a minute here. And not much was ever uh, heard from him again. Are you, are you okay? I use this? Uh, but good gold. And when you got to go, you got to go. go. That's right. Well, I guess this is the end right here, huh? Yeah. <laughs>